How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? Rick Adams here, your producer and host for The Deadly Experiment. As we always greet uh, listeners, friend and foe alike, we're living in a time very close now to the end, as you know. Time is running out, as one minister used to say many years ago on local radio, and it is running out. Time is short. And by that, I mean the events around the world and uh, what is happening to America from within are propelling uh, this world to a terminus, that is, a, an end as we know it, this world system. Not the earth, but the world system that we live under since the creation or recreation of this earth system in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, verse 2, when God recreated and replenished the earth. See, there was an earth system, there was a world system before this age, as we've shown you so many countless times, a world in which there was flesh and animal life, dinosaurs, Leviathan, as it's referred to in the scripture, all of that came to an end, but the evidence thereof is abundant. God destroyed that first age, and he's going to destroy this age, too. He's going to take it down when Jesus Christ comes in flaming fire. He's not going to be riding into town on an ass anymore. He's going to be coming on the white horse with a sword to cut down. And his first destructive event will be the city of Jerusalem, as it is spoken of in the Gospel of Matthew and 24 and 25, and in many places where he takes his apostles and says, you see this wall here standing in Jerusalem? That will not be here when I return. Nothing will exist. Earthquake will hit the city of Jerusalem in the very last days when two witnesses sent back by God to witness to that evil city, the rulers of that city, are killed. They're slain in the streets. That's the ultimate act of murder against God's elect. We believe them to be, one of them to be Moses, the other Elijah. We don't know because it's not told us in the scriptures. But Moses really was never buried. We never found his bones. Elijah was taken up in glory. The prophet Elijah, who witnessed as a ministry of Zadok, Zadok, Melchizedek, that is the high priest, the upright one. God has his favorites and he has his children who are going to be sealed in the mind when that day of Antichrist comes. Antichrist means instead of Christ, as you'll see on the subsequent programs that we have coming up. A word by word discussion in the book of Genesis. So today we are going to, we're going to refer to a special documentary produced um, by one of my personal friends who's worked with me in broadcasting, Corbett. His name is James Corbett, the Corbett Report, on how corrupt this whole earth and heaven age system is in terms of media corruption. You see, we wouldn't see the corruption people who watch these programs and others like it online and in other venues would not see the corruption were it not for the divine vision that God has given them. And the reason is everybody else is in darkness. Why is the world in darkness? Well, the essential means of mind control is the media. He who controls the media controls the mind. It just so happens that the latest, as of this recording, the latest Gallup polls taken on the American public's perception of media corruption have revealed an astronomical increase, not just in disbelief or lack of credibility in the media, but out and out hatred for the mass media, as it's called. We call it la kosha media. It is a kosha nostra of the mind. That is, all of the key players in the media, in the Trump administration, in Congress, as we see in Rhode Island with Langey Boy and the rest of them, all of the key players in the political, the economic, the media, which is part of the whole business of academia, and finally, the religious beast system all across the world are preaching the same message, the message of lies, that we need to continue to wage war in order to fight an enemy that was created by us. <laughs> it's a pretty good deal. It certainly benefits the military industrial media complex now, doesn't it? It does. But how does it serve the purpose of America? Well, it doesn't. 
It's not intended to. As we've shown repeatedly on these programs, which you can see on YouTube as well, many of them, we have shown repeatedly that America is hostage to the Rothschild Rockefeller cabal, which through the Council on Foreign Relations, the World Zionist Organization, the Zionist Organization of America, APAC, and a host of others control both media, the economy through banking. Uh, we've seen this with Secretary Mnuchin of the Treasury now, replacing Jack Lou, another of the tribe. And of course, the political. Who runs the political campaigns that are worth anything in Congress? Well, we know who. We know they're in the right place at the right time. Who are they? The sons of Cain, who call themselves Judah, but are not, and do lie, and are of the synagogue of Satan. That's what Jesus said, the prophet said it, Isaiah said it, all of them said it. So what we need to do is understand their words, their meanings. I'm going to read to you in a little bit, I think after this segment by Mr. Corbett, I'm going to read to you from the scriptures, from the book of Leviticus. That's the law, the tribe of Levi, the Levitical priesthood, and the 12 tribes of Israel all coming under Levi, the Levitical priesthood. That's very important to understand because we here today are the descendants of those in ancient times called themselves Jacob Israel. Jacob was the father of 12 sons. The sons of Jacob became the sons of Israel. Jacob was renamed Israel, as we're told in the book of Genesis, because Israel, the supplanter, actually became Israel the identity of God's people, that is, the nation of God, through which the whole world would be, in effect, witness to the blood sacrifices of Jesus Christ when he would come. So in the book of Leviticus, after this segment by Mr. Corbett, I'm going to read to you where America and where Providence and where North Providence and where Rhode Island is today and how we don't really have much time left. But I will tell you this, there is no hope apart from him, from the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. There is no turning back. Everything now is in flux, out of control. The whole world, the whole state is just absolutely steeping in corruption, steeping in economic depravity, more debt than ever before, and it must end, and it will end, when the man of sin comes to heal the nations of the world. And that's when those two witnesses I refer to will be slain in the streets of Jerusalem, because Jerusalem is the epicenter of one world control, that city of Antichrist, ruled by the synagogue of Satan. Very simple for those that have eyes to see and ears to hear. What's your excuse? All right, right now, how deep is deep state? That is the corruption of so-called intel in America. That includes about 17 agencies of government now that are what we call the old Maxwell smart routine, you know? Uh, you know, get smart. Well, they're getting dumber and dumber on purpose. America today is ruled by a deep state intel media military alliance that is destroying what's left of america through worldwide war constant things like bombing syrians and bombing afghanistan deeper now than at any other time since world war one and two right now james corbett will show you how the key players in the media worked with the government the cia and the pentagon to deceive you the american public Let's roll them. Welcome. This is James Corbett of The Corbett Report with your eye-opener report for BoilingFrogsPost.com. A recent article in Wired has once again brought attention to the issue of the CIA's relationship to mainstream media in the United States. The article, entitled The CIA Pitches Scripts to Hollywood, highlights the CIA's Public Affairs Office's Entertainment Industry Liaison an officer that works with writers, producers, and showbiz execs to develop scripts and stories, provide tours of CIA headquarters, and arrange interviews with agents about their background. As the Wired article points out, the office also provides ideas for stories about the agency and its assets for those who are looking for the material for a spy thriller. Although the thought of the CIA working hand-in-hand -hand with Hollywood and the publishing industry to provide officially sanctioned agency yarns is unsettling to many, 
The entertainment liaison position has been around for years, and the topic of how the CIA has worked to furnish the creators of Hollywood films like Charlie Wilson's War with their inaccurate take on the agency's history has been explored in depth. What is even more disturbing than the agency's whitewashing of its own history and methods in works of fiction, however, is the less closely examined relationship of the CIA to the news media. It is uncontested fact that the CIA has enjoyed a long and intimate relationship with some of the largest news organizations in the world, and has used this relationship to manipulate, censor, and even fabricate news stories in support of its own covert agenda. The story of that relationship was told most famously and most comprehensively by Carl Bernstein in Rolling Stone magazine in 1977. In his landmark article entitled The CIA and the Media, Bernstein outlined the history of the agency's use of assets in the news media from the 1950s through the 70s. The ties between the intelligence community and the news organizations were formalized at the highest levels of management and ownership and included, according to Bernstein, cooperation with media tycoons like Arthur Hayes Sulzberger of the New York Times, Henry Luce of Time Inc., and William Paley of CBS. Toward the end of his career, Sig Mickelson, the head of CBS News in the 1950s and the man credited with launching the career of the most trusted man in America, Walter Cronkite, admitted that CBS News worked closely with the CIA. Uh, at CBS, uh, we uh, had been contacted by the CIA. As a matter of fact, by the time I became the head of the whole news and public affairs operation in 1954, the ships had been established, and I was told about them and asked if I'd carry on with them. I think it was entirely in order for our correspondents at that time uh, to make use of the uh, CIA agent ch uh, chiefs uh, of station and other members of the executive staff of CIA as sources of information which were useful in their assessments of world conditions. Would you say that continues today? Well, I, yeah, I would think probably for a reporter it would continue today, but because of all of the revelations of the period of the 1970s, uh, it seems to me that a reporter has got to be much more circumspect in doing it now, or he runs the risk of uh, at least being looked at with considerable disfavor by the public. I think you've got to be much more careful about it. The Bernstein article drew heavily on the findings of the Church Committee of 1975 and 1976, a congressional investigation into the actions of the intelligence community, to identify the various types of associations between the CIA and the media, from legitimate, accredited reporters who worked with the agency or carried out tasks on its behalf, often on a voluntary basis, to stringers and freelancers directly on the agency pay payroll, to columnists and co commentators like C.L. Sulzberger of the New York Times and the Alsop brothers of the Saturday Evening Post and Newsweek, who could be counted on to insert agency-friendly comments and editorials into leading news outlets, thus effectively setting the, the agenda for the national media. The Church Committee exposed some of the dirt of the CIA's interference in domestic media, officially established as Operation Mockingbird by Frank Wisner, the director of the agency's covert intelligence branch, the Office of Special Projects, in 1948. However, when the committee began asking more specific and more potentially damaging questions, the CIA, then under the leadership of George H.W. Bush, issued a blanket statement that it would stop directly employing journalists and quietly directed the committee to change the focus of its inquiry. I thought that it was a matter of uh, real concern that planted stories intended to serve a national purpose abroad um, came home and were circulated here and believed here because uh, this would mean that the CIA could manipulate the news in the United States by channeling it through some foreign country. And we're looking at that very carefully. Do you have any people being paid by the CIA, who are contributing to a major circulation American journal. We do have people who submit pieces to other to American journals. Do you have any people paid by the CIA who are working for television networks? This, I think, gets into the kind of uh, getting into the details, Mr. Chairman, that I'd like to get into in executive session. Over the years, numerous specific examples of the agency's manipulation of the news media have surfaced, 
including multiple instances where stories that had been outright fabricated by CIA assets had resulted in the justification for military intervention. In the 1980s, for instance, a story about Russian MiGs being delivered to Nicaragua appeared on the front page of the New York Times. A CIA analyst turned whistleblower David McMichael later revealed this had been completely made up, but was reported as fact as a way of manipulating public opinion to support U.S. intervention in the region. How about this for a story? Just under a year ago, the Americans discovered a Soviet freighter carrying MiG fighter planes, which they said were on their way to Nicaragua. Here's the story on the front of the Times. Moscow warned on Nicaraguan MiGs, and there's a picture of a MiG-21. According to President Reagan, this showed that Nicaragua was a threat to the United States. Uh, and as it turned out, this was, uh, the evidence for this was based on satellite photography, which showed crates at an East European port uh, facility, uh, which were determined to be, in the science of cratology, the uh, crates of the sort in which MiG aircraft uh, frequently were shipped. And subsequent photographs a day or two later uh, showed that these crates had, were no longer on the dock. And an amazing uh, leap of logic it, uh, was advanced that necessarily they must have been uh, delivered to, to Nicaragua or were on their way to be delivered to Nicaragua. Well, the, you know, it's the usual thing. The charge makes the headlines. The retraction makes the inside pages. Eight or ten days later, it's revealed, well, MiGs weren't on the way, but that's no longer a headline. So what one is left with is the overall impression from the screaming headlines of the week earlier that Nicaragua continues to represent this enormous danger to the security of the United States. This nation of three million impoverished souls, half of whom are under the age of 15, you know. In an infamous story from the 1970s revealed by CIA whistleblower John Stockwell, a story about rapes committed by Cuban soldiers in Angola, which was widely reported around the world, had in fact been completely made up by CIA assets in the press. So he came up with another story which he in fact kept going for weeks and it was a good story in terms of the CIA's propaganda interests. He had some Cuban soldiers uh, raping some young Angolan girls. Uh, then there was a battle and he had uh, that Cuban unit cut off and captured. And then he had the Cuban women, the victims, identifying their rapists. And then there was a trial and they were convicted. And then he had them executed by a firing squad of the women who had supposedly been violated with photographs of, of, of young African women with uh, weapons shooting down these Cubans. Uh, there had never been a rape. There had never been the military action. The Cubans had never been captured. Uh, it was all fiction. Stockwell did extremely well with this story. Here's the Daily Express of March the 12th, 1976. Gun girls execute Cuban rapists is the headline. And quoting from UNITA, it says that 17 Cubans were executed, five of whom had been identified as the people who had raped four African women a few weeks before. And here's the evening standard, with a bit more convincing detail, saying the Cubans were shot with their own guns. And here's the Daily Telegraph, the newspaper of record, adding a bit more detail, identifying the region from which the women came and saying that they took part in the executions. The reporter was John Bullock. I haven't the faintest idea where it was true, and I never said it was true. I reported somebody as saying that, as telling me that story. I certainly didn't report the facts. Similarly, in Libya this year, shortly after Obama admitted the presence of covert operatives on the ground in Libya, identified as CIA agents by the New York Times, with the admitted goal of destabilizing the Gaddafi government, a story surfaced about Gaddafi's troops that was immediately picked up and reported unquestioningly by nearly every news outlet in the world. In the morgue, Gaddafi soldiers killed in the fight for Ashdabia, and in the pockets of their uniforms, Viagra and condoms, weapons of war. President Muammar Gaddafi is also rejecting allegations. He ordered his troops to rape women as a way to spread fear and dissent in the early days of the liberation. Now the International Criminal Court says there is evidence that Colonel Gaddafi ordered his forces to use rape as a weapon of war. And that's why for us was, we had doubts at the beginning, but now we're more convinced. Apparently he decided to, to punish using rapes who in the Libya tradition is really something very bad, beyond the limits, I would say. 
And also, we are finding some elements confirming this issue of acquisition of um, Viagra type of, of uh, medicaments to show in the policy. No? They, they were buying containers with products to enhance the possibility to rape women, and we, we are possibly getting the information on that in detail confirming the policy. So we're trying to see who was involved. Well, one of the things he wants to investigate now, he says, is priorities to investigate allegations of rape, rape that may be systematic and rape that's being assisted, he said, by the distribution of Viagra or Viagra-like products, sexually uh, performance-enhancing products that are getting in the hands of uh, Gaddafi's forces and are being used uh, as part of gang rape. It was later admitted that there was in fact no evidence whatsoever to back up these assertions, but that news was not heralded with anything near the same attention that the original accusations had garnered. It's universally understood that such operations still take place, but without whistleblowers and insiders exposing the truth, it's impossible to tell exactly what stories in our own day and age have been completely fabricated by intelligence agencies with a vested interest in manipulating public opinion. We can see the tentacles of the CIA when it steps in to attempt to stop the publication of certain stories, however, as when the agency threatened independent documentary filmmakers John Duffy and Rayno Volshelsky from publishing the names of two recently identified CIA agents, Alfreda Francis Bukowski and Michael Ann Casey. The two were threatened with legal action should they publish the names of Bukowski and Casey under a law preventing the naming of CIA analysts that has never in history been applied to journalists who discovered such information in the public record, as Duffy and Novoshelsky did. Earlier this week, Washington Post national security correspondent Joby Warwick confirmed on the Peter B. Collins podcast that the Post knew about the identity of Bukowski for years, but it held off on publishing the story at the behest of the CIA. It is no longer disputed that the CIA has maintained an extensive and ongoing relationship with news organizations and journalists, and multiple specific acts of media manipulation have now been documented. But as long as the public continues to ignore the influence of intelligence agencies in shaping or even fabricating news stories, the agency will continue to be able to set the policy that drives the American war machine at will. All right. Bless your hearts. Thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, for observing that important segment. And, you know, it's amazing how the... Uh, you know, George Patton was a great general. Unfortunately, it took him a little bit longer than uh, others who uh, maybe others didn't wake up at all. But World War II, he uh, he said he would resign, not retire, but resign from his command in Europe because he was so disgusted with what he saw with Eisenhower, who was working directly with the Soviet Union in World War II before he was contacting his superiors in Washington. It's a very interesting subject that was brought out by uh, some of the people that have written books, British historians, particularly Arthur Bryan, who wrote about uh, Eisenhower and uh, his crusade in Europe. But General Patton said that uh, he would come home and resign the U.S. military. He would throw away his medals, in effect, come before the American people and say that we were totally on the wrong side in World War II, which we shouldn't have been in to begin with. Nevertheless, he would have shown the betrayal of freedom throughout Europe. And General Patton never came home to tell that story. We know that he was targeted. We know that Intel, the Office of Strategic Services, which former Governor Bruce Sunland served in, was responsible for most likely the assassination of Patton. And even Bill O'Reilly, uh, formerly with uh, Fox News Network, wrote his book, which was a, a copy of another book called T uh, Target uh, Patton in World War II. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, as you've just seen here, that the military industrial media complex are one. There is no dividing line any longer with big media, no separation, no demarcation. They work as one. That is why you can be deceived by a 9-11, which we've shown you was the work of the Israeli Mossad with key assets in the Pentagon, in this government, including the office of the Vice President Dick Cheney and W, who was reading a book upside down when that attack on the Twin Towers and uh, at the Pentagon and Shanksville took place. 
Ladies and gentlemen, we need to understand what's befallen America. America is being judged. America would be the land where the 12, excuse me, the 10 so-called lost tribes of Israel would arrive after they had come out of bondage in the Assyrian captivity. Um, hundreds, well, about 2,500 years ago now. And uh, the tribe of Judah would be liberated from its captivity under King Nebuchadnezzar. Unfortunately, the so-called people who call themselves the Judahites today and are not, but do lie, would like the world to think they are the tribe of Judah when they most definitely, positively are not. Most of your preachers say, well, of course they are. And they've ignored the other 10 tribes and said they couldn't possibly have come to the United States and established the new Jerusalem. Look at the tabernacle in the book of Exodus, the tabernacle that God instructed Moses and Aaron to build was in fact a tabernacle made of three colors red, white, and blue. They were the flag of ancient Israel at that time. Does that sound familiar? Sure does. Now I want to tell you before we run out of time today in just a couple of moments. In the book of Leviticus, the reason why we are where we are today, why Providence is a mess, why it's a sanctuary city, why it's an ID city, why it's a city that is uh, tr just absolutely riveted with violence, plagued by economic dislocation, all kinds of problems on the streets, and yet money's flowing into the hands of the Thanes and others as of this hour. Now, in the book of Leviticus, which is just before the other books of the Bible, which of course we know I'm in right now reading daily the book of Numbers, and then of course Deuteronomy. Moses wrote, as God instructed him, in chapter 26, verse 27. Prior to this, he said that when you obey my law, my children of Israel, you will be blessed immensely. And in verse 27, and if ye will not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary unto me, then I will walk contrary unto you also a fury. And I even I will chastise you and your governing your seven times. I will give you a judgment upon your cities, upon your land, upon your nation. He says in verse 29, and ye shall eat the flesh of your son and the flesh of your daughters, and ye shall suffer the destruction in your high places, and I will cut down your images, your graven images, your apostasy, your Easter bunnies, in so many words, and cast your carcasses upon the carcasses of your idols. And he says, I will make your cities waste. I will make them waste and bring your sanctuaries unto desolation. Does that sound familiar? That sound like Providence? Hmm? Sound like Rhode Island? Sound like America? It certainly does. You see, God is not marked. He is not marked. He says that whatever you sow, especially his people here in America and Europe today, ye shall also reap. We're reaping the consequences. And the worst is yet to come, my friends. But there is hope in, in Messiah, in the Lord Jesus Christ and him crucified. We're out of time. Thank you all for joining us on the Deadly Experiment. Remember, keep in the word of God, keep faithful to him, and everything will indeed turn out all right, particularly for his elected. Yahweh bless his elect today.